If you've watched British football at any point in the last century, you've seen the designs and engineering of a Scot named Archibald Leach. At the turn of the 20th century, the sport was only just becoming a social and cultural phenomenon, and as the appetite for the game grew and the working and middle classes had the disposable income for leisure activities, football chiefs became obsessed with the task of cramming as many fans into their grounds as possible. The man appointed to design the vast majority of these new grounds was Archibald Leach. Leach began his career as a factory engineer, one of many Scots to construct the railways, factories, sheds and infrastructure within the British Empire. The Scots had a disproportionate influence on the machinations of Britain in the 19th century, turning Glasgow into a hub of industry. But they also dominated the landscape of football and sport in general in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. As Simon Inglis writes in his wonderful Leach biography, Engineering Archie, all the great teams in the late Victorian era, Preston North End's Invincibles of 1888-89, Sunderland's Team of Talents in the 1890s, were built around Scottish talent. The influence of Scots on industrial engineering, sport and football itself meant that a man like Archibald Leach was the ideal candidate to design the seminal football grounds of Britain. But Leach didn't have groundbreaking stadium ideas, he simply saw the opportunity that engineering football stadiums presented at a time when no one else did. Leach saw, and felt, the passion for the game and the growing number of fans determined to watch matches up close. Inglis told Tifo, The one thing that makes Archibald Leach different, or at least a pioneer, was not that he had any particular special knowledge that got him into the business, it's that he saw the opportunities in the world of professional sport, and, because of his love for football, decided to go into it. He had no special knowledge that would enable him to do that, but then, nobody did at that time. Born and raised in Glasgow, Leach was a passionate Rangers fan, and was commissioned to design Ibrox Park in 1899. Over the next three decades, Leach was commissioned south of the border at Bramall Lane, Ireson Park, Craven Cottage, Stamford Bridge, Anfield, Ewood Park, Park Avenue, Valley Parade, Goodison Park, White Hart Lane, Old Trafford, The Den, Leeds Road, Roker Park, Highbury, and about 15 other stadiums. So, what did a Leach-designed stadium look like? Well, he moved the football grounds of the Victorian era from, as Inglis writes, cinder and gravel banks, muddied earth, wooden barriers nailed together and thumped randomly into the ground, to industrial, codified and rigid terraces, adorned with crush rails to prevent the kind of disasters that befell those that braved the terraces of British football throughout the 20th century. David Goldblatt, sports journalist and sociologist, describes the Leachian stadium in his book The Ball is Round, A Global History of Soccer, as an enclosed stadium that had a covered, seated grandstand on one long side of the pitch and open terraces on the other three. As the ambition of both clubs and designer grew, Leach innovated by producing two-tier grandstands, some with seating above and standing below. In his later efforts, he created stadiums with cover on all four sides of the ground, and seating and standing on each side as well. Now, because of Leach's background in factory engineering, these grounds possessed a certain industrial functionality. The goal was simply to pack as many paying fans into an area to watch football as was possible. But Leach wasn't reckless. His designs were systematic and precise. These stadiums were perfectly designed for fans to watch the football, the sight lines were unobstructed. The placement of crush barriers and aisles meant that fans couldn't rush more than a few yards from their designated area. Yet Leach's work wasn't without its flaws. Tragedy befell supporters at two Leach-designed stadiums, Ibrox Park and Hillsborough, almost a century apart. The Ibrox disaster of 1902, during a match between Scotland and England, occurred as an upper part of the terrace snapped and sent spectators falling, as if through a trapdoor. The resulting panic caused more casualties and deaths, and a long, protracted legal dispute began to find the culpable party. Ultimately, 25 people died, and at least 516 were injured. 587 would receive compensation. But this was the machine age. Disasters like this were quite commonplace. Trains going off tracks, factories going up in flames, boilers combusting, ships sinking. This was the cost of industry and progress. Rangers had to decide who would redesign and reconstruct Ibrox Park in the wake of this disaster. 
According to a letter from Leach to the club chairman, obtained by Inglis, the Glasgow club was very close to choosing another engineer but ultimately decided to retain Leach. He was determined to right the mistakes made at Ibrox, and a blueprint of his subsequent designs for Craven Cottage in 1905 reveal a system of preventing the sort of crush and overcrowding that occurred on the terraces of Britain throughout the 20th century. Inglis writes that, following the mistakes at Ibrox, Leach implemented a system of distributing passages and crush rails fixed equidistantly between sunken aisles, each four feet in width. This became the standard amongst British terraces, and was used by the Guide to Safety at Sports Grounds, of which Inglis is the editor, in 1973. Leach's terrace designs stood up over half a century later as the pinnacle of stadium safety. Now, it's clear that the Ibrox disaster informed Leach's future designs to make sure there were no repeats, and it was a departure from those designs that would lead to one of the darkest days in English football. Sports grounds, unlike stadiums, are subject to constant change. There is no final blueprint when a ground is opened, and subsequent remodelling and redesigns are standard. At Anfield's Cop End, originally a leech design, redesigns during the 1920s in which a roof was added ended up in disaster, and for the next 50 years or so, there were 40 casualties and injuries a week in the Cop. As was the case at Hillsborough, with renovations during the decades after initial construction in 1913, changing the precision of Leach's designs. While the failures at Hillsborough related to crowd control and ineffective policing, English told Tifo, had Hillsborough been designed to the kind of specifications that Leach drew out at, say, Chelsea and Fulham in 1904-05, a good 80 years before the disaster, there may not have been such a great loss of life. It's a bit like you design a perfect car and someone comes along in two years, they change the wheels or they change a bit of the engine. And ironically, it was the disaster at Ibrox that allowed Leach to design a system that would have saved lives at Hillsborough some 80 years later, but those designs had been eroded away by then. As the football grounds of Britain changed, from the Leachian grounds that became synonymous with British football to more modern, continental-style stadiums, Leach's designs slowly fade from view. Fulham, Dundee United, Portsmouth, Everton and Rangers are the only remaining original Leach stands or grandstands of the 40 or so grounds that he engineered. The man who crafted the look and feel of British football in its infancy died without any real fanfare in 1939, but his legacy remains in the memories, legends and the carnage of the terraces of British football. Thank you.